Welcome to WebRTC Tips by WebRTC Ventures. In today's tip, one of our engineers, Alfred Gonzalez, is going to talk to you about uh, his experience with scaling a WebRTC application. This comes up certainly a lot with our clients. Sometimes we're building an application for our clients for the first time, and you're initially just worried about getting it to work, testing your business concept, getting users excited about it. But then comes that time when hopefully you're really successful and you're ready to scale it to a larger audience. And this can be really tricky. And so there's a lot of considerations to take into account here, some of which Alfred is going to cover in this video, where he talks anonymously about a uh, application that we worked on where we didn't do the initial version of it, but we've helped the client to better scale that application. And so there's some interesting tidbits in here for anybody, re regardless of whether you're just starting to build your application from scratch or you have an existing live video application that you want to scale now for the first time. So I'll leave it to Alfred to take it from there. All right, thank you. So I'm Alfred Gonzalez, a WebRTC engineer at WebRTC Ventures. And I'm going to talk about uh, refactoring a WebRTC up to scale. So increasing the amount of user connections a WebRTC app can handle is an important part of our work. If we set an infrastructure that is able to scale, then we can provide the resources as needed. In our case, we upgraded our infrastructure by setting a Kubernetes cluster where multiple instances of our services could run. This way, if there is an increase of users, we can increment the number of instances of the services we are running in, in the cluster. And if there is a decrease, we could also freeze some resources and this way, we are able to handle the demand we are facing. And another benefit of this infrastructure upgrade is that in case of a service failure, we will have other instances of that service running. But this type of infrastructure upgrades comes with some issues we have to face. And I'm going to talk about some of the issues and how we manage to solve them. The main problems are related to communication and data management. In our application, there are two main services, which are the REST API and the wrapper. The REST API receives requests from, from the client and sends messages to the wrapper. And the wrapper handles all the current or related logic. So, we have to be able to make requests from service to service, which we were already doing before the infrastructure upgrade. But now we have multiple instances of a service. And we want the request to be only processed by a single instance of a service. So for example, we wouldn't want to create uh, the same connection twice in, in two different instances of the wrapper. And we, we were using RabbitMQ for the communication, which already allows us to consume messages only once, even if there are multiple consumers of the same queue. So for example, the client are, are sending messages to the REST APIs, and those messages are being sent to the, to the session queue, and the messages would be consumed by, by the wrappers listeners, and not not a single message would be consumed twice. And later I will explain how we set up those session listeners for for the wrappers. Also, we we have fan out exchange where we can send messages to multiple queues. So we can send a single message. Uh, to multiple users of a session. For example, we have a session with two users and there's a third user that joins. That user would send uh, a request and the request would arrive to a wrapper and the wrapper would send a single message to the session exchange that uh, a new user arrived. And that message would arrive to to all the users that are bound to that exchange. 
So we send a message to the session exchange. We have two user queues bound to that exchange, and the message would be consumed by both queues. And we can also send messages directly to to the user queue, and all the messages would be stored in in the user queue until they are consumed. And we use HTTP polling to receive all the messages sent to the user. That is that a user is sending a message to the REST API to receive all the messages sent to, to its queue. And it would consume all the messages that were sent to the directly to the queue, which for, for this example would be the message to. And all the messages sent to the session exchange, which would be the message one. And this way, we we have all, all the messages uh, being received by, by the users. And the same would be for the user two. He would send a, a HTTP poll and would consume the message one and three. Why do we need data persistence? So previously we had data stored in the service memory, which makes it vulnerable to server failure. We wouldn't be able to retrieve the data if the server dropped. And furthermore, since each instance of a service, the wrapper, for example, can process different requests of a session, the instances would have different data. There would be data inconsistency. So we could have the session one with three users connected and the wrapper one would have two users and the wrapper two only one. And the, we wouldn't be able to create the connections between user one and two and user three and two. So we decided to use Mongo database to store all the data related to a session, which are the users their connections and some other data. This way we are able to process requests from all instances and the data will be consistent since we will we will be reading it from and writing on the Mongo database. When we create a session, a message is sent to the REST API from the client and it will create a session queue which would be the queue session one. And it will send a create session message to the wrapper queue. But this message will only be consumed by a single wrapper, which in this case would be wrapper one. And wrapper one would create a session message listener for future requests on the queue session. And it will also create the session insert a new session in the database. This session message listener is the one that handles all the requests, like the joins, the offers, the ICE candidates that will be sent from the clients. And besides storing the, the data from that session, like media pipelines, new users and connections, it will also create the WebRTC endpoints, connect the endpoints, gather ice candidates, send answers, send ice candidates. We'll do everything we, we need. But this way, only a single instance of the wrapper would process the, the requests to, to a queue. We only have this listener set right now. And we want all other wrapper instances to, to be able to process requests that go to, to that session queue. So to do that, we used reactive streams from MongoDB, which allows us to set listeners to data changes in the database. In our case, we set a listener for inserts in, in the session collection. So when the create session message goes to the wrapper queue, and is consumed by the wrapper one, it will it will create the session message listener and also insert the a new session. And this would trigger the reactive stream 
which is set for for all the uh, wrapper instances. So if we had two two more wrappers here, uh, the it would trigger for for all the wrappers, and that would create the session message listener for that wrapper. So we could have all wrappers consuming from the session queue. This allows us to process uh, the request from for with multiple wrappers. So future requests to that session queue would go through the through any of the consumers through the message listeners we set. We also had an issue with uh, storing the data since there are some objects of of our session uh, object that can be stored directly into Mongo database. For example, the, the media pipeline and WebRTC endpoint can be stored in MongoDB. So to solve that, we used custom conversions from Mongo for reading and writing. It maps uh, MongoDB documents into our Java objects and vice versa. So for example, we could have a, a session with a media pipeline and when we store it in the database, we would store instead of the object, we would store the media pipeline ID. And then when we read the session back, we use that ID to retrieve the media pipeline object using some current client methods. So we would get the, the current server of that session. Then uh, the pipelines of that current server and then find the the pipeline that matches or ID. This way we would retrieve the, the media pipeline object. And we also faced uh, an issue with data consistency. When multiple uh, wrapper instances were modifying the same session at the same time or a similar same time. So imagine from, from session one, we we have two users, user one and two, each one with two connections. And then there's a, a new user, the user three that is joining and it's sending requests to the wrapper. And the wrapper, the instance one of the wrapper, so wrapper one would receive a request to add connection three one and wrapper two to add the connection three two. And wrapper one would, so both wrappers would read the, the session object from the database, which would be with four connections. Uh, they would read it at the same time or similarly time, similar time. And wrapper one would add that connection, the connection three one and store it. But later the wrapper two would Add connection three two to 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 the same object and store it, which would override the data that was changed in wrapper one. So we would lose some data there. The solution was to use partial updates. That is to modify the data that is required to be modified instead of the whole document. So instead of uh, getting the document, modifying it and storing it, we are uh, filtering and updating at the same time. We use the update one method from Mongo collection, which accepts a filter that matches the document you want to update and an update uh, statement. In the update statement, you can specify the, the changes that need to be applied using update operators. We used uh, set, push and pull and also the array identifier. This way we can set a specific value, push a value into, into an array or pull one element from an array. So for example, if we had the whole session with three users and all three connections, if we want to remove the user three, we we can delete that user from the Mongo database by pulling the user three 
from the user array of, of the session where session ID equals one. And this way we, we would remove the this user and all the connections. And we can also delete the connections linked to that user, which would be connection 3.1 and connection 3.2 from all users of the of the session one by pulling all the connections with with user with a user value three. And another thing worth to mention is how to handle the reconnection. We have two different cases, which would be when a KMS uh, drops from a when a KMS drops or a client drops from a call. So if a KMS uh, current media server uh, goes down, we would need to connect all the users that were in that session using a different KMS. And in the second case, with the client dropping, it would only require the a user to reconnect back to, to the session. So when a KMS goes down, all users, all the clients, would get a disconnected event in the browser, and they would try to send a reconnect or join message to to, our, to the REST API and then to the wrapper. And when handling the, the reconnect request uh, of the session, we detect that there is no media pipeline since there, the server is down. So the media pipeline of, of the session doesn't exist. Then we check for KMS availability. We may have multiple uh, KMS for for the cluster. And when checking for the availability, we try to reconnect the KMS that is that has dropped. And we select it if it's working back again, or we can select a different available KMS. That would be the one with the lowest memory usage. So we look first for availability, try to reconnect the, the, K, the, the ones that are not available. And the ones that are available, we select the one with the lowest memory usage. Then we just create a new media pipeline for, for the session reconnection and save it in the Mongo database. And all future requests that go to that session will use the new media pipeline to create the, the connections. And if a client drops, it will try to, to reconnect to the session sending joint requests to, to the REST API. But it can sometimes be too sensitive. We, we've seen uh, micro drops. And we don't want the client to try to reconnect when there's a micro drop that doesn't even disconnect the user. So we need to limit the reconnect sensitivity. We, we could add a timer or a counter before trying to, to reconnect. All right, thank you so much, Alfred, for sharing those tips with us today on scaling your WebRTC application. If you're ready to build your live video application, contact us at WebRTC Ventures. You can go to webrtc.ventures. You can follow us on Twitter. Contact us there. We'd be happy to apply our expertise in building live video applications for 